What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. We're looking at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Very important because as he lays the foundation for what he is about to say, he will not only demonstrate that he is not the guilty one, but that those who are his accusers are the guilty one. Of course, his sermon here in Acts chapter 7 ends in his death, and it also introduces us to a young man who later will become the Apostle Paul, one who writes most of the New Testament. We do not understand the sovereign workings of God, but we see them clearly set forth for us in the portion of the text that we look at tonight. Last week, you recall that we looked at the foundation of promise in verses 1 through 8. And as a good lawyer would do, Stephen lays a foundation so that he might set the stage for what he is about to convict his accusers of. The first stone in the foundation, we saw there were eight of them, was truth under pressure. He is placed on the stand. He is asked after he has heard the accusations, are these things so? So he is given a free reign to say as he will. And the question we asked ourselves was, do you know what you believe? And do you know why you believe it? Stephen was required to testify. It was an open-ended question, but he was articulate in his faith. He understood the history of Israel. He understood where he had come from. He understood what had happened as the, the nation had gone apostate. He understood where he was going, and he was unafraid. The second stone that we saw on the foundation was divine revelation. He speaks of those things that God revealed. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. We must begin with divine revelation. If we start with our own reason, if we start with our own logic, we will always come to a false conclusion because sin has tainted every part of man. Man is not as bad as he could be. There are people who are mild and pleasant can, uh, as contrasted with those who are vicious and ugly. But sin has permeated every aspect of our being. Total depravity does not mean that you're just as bad as you could possibly be. You could be a lot worse than you are. God's grace restrains you from being as bad as you are and the working of the Holy Spirit during this time in which we live prior to the rapture is restraining evil. Paul tells us that in his epistles to the Thessalonians. But there will come a day when all restraint will be removed and suddenly you will see man in his truly most vicious state. We start with divine revelation. Without that we do not know what is truth. 
The third stone in the foundation is faith to obey. Not merely faith to believe in our hearts and yea, say that is true, we agree with that, but it's faith to obey. In fact, it's not only faith to obey, but it's faith to obey in the uncomfortable commands that God gives to us. Because God said to Abraham in verse 3, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into a land which I will show thee. Then he came out. It's very important for us to understand that when God gives a call, it may not be the comfortable thing that we want to do, but there must be faith to obey. The book of Hebrews makes it very clear that this is one of the key issues of faith. Speaking of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and those who followed, it said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Faith to obey even the uncomfortable commands. The fourth stone we saw was patience to wait for God's timing. How often we want the promise to occur now. How often we push at God and say, why haven't I received the answer to prayer that I wanted now? Patience to wait. Paul explains to us that tribulation worketh patience. We're not happy with God's method of developing patience in us, but he calls us to obey. We obey in the uncomfortable circumstances of life, and then with patience we wait for his promises. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The fifth stone in the foundation ties directly into that because it is continuing to believe the word of God, even when there is nothing tangible to show for our faith. Very clear here because we find Abraham endures. There's endurance that's involved. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke in his parable of the sower how there are those who will hear the word of God and they spring up immediately. But because the soil is not deep and they have no roots, when the sun comes out and beats on them, they wither away. They have no endurance. There are those who would love to hear the gospel and the escape from hell message. But when life doesn't suddenly turn into a cushiony bed of roses, they no longer endure, but they wither away. How many Christians, those who professed at least to be Christians, have you known who were all excited at one point in their life about the gospel of Christ? But when pressure comes, when the persecution of the world comes, when even a little mockery comes from those around them, they do not endure, but they wither away. The fifth stone in the foundation continuing to believe, even when there's nothing tangible to show for your faith. The sixth stone is desiring the promise that God gives. You know, there are sometimes promises in the word of God that we don't, really desire. There are sometimes promises in the word of God that we wish were not there. Here we see a situation where God told Abraham, it's going to be difficult, you're going to have your descendants out of the land, they're going to be in a strange land, they're going to be in slavery, they're going to be there for 400 years of persecution. That was a promise of God to Abraham when he kept the covenant with him. When Abraham took the animals and divided them in half and a, a horror of a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and the Shekinah glory of God passed in between those parts, God gave him that promise. That was part of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. Do you desire the promise of God even though it may seem difficult, even though it may seem painful? Do you desire the promise of God because you know that God is good? And whatever he does will be for your good. The seventh stone that we saw was believing that God will judge the wicked even when there is no apparent movement of the hand of God in verse 7. Oh, how often have you wished that someone who has hurt you, who has insulted you, who has taken from you something that is yours by right, 
How often have you wished that the hand of God would fall upon you? I confess that I've had that sinful attitude too. There have been times in my life when I wished God would really judge somebody very harshly for what they had done to me. I was personally offended. And I think the Lord probably just smiled and in heaven he was saying, well, my child is going to have to do some more growing. Because you see, this world is not a pleasant world. This world is not our home. We are merely transients moving through this to our ultimate home, which is in heaven. And things don't always go the way that we wish they would go here in this world. The eighth stone in the foundation is visibly, openly, precisely, and personally identifying with the promises of God. Regardless of what other people think, here in this case, the illustration that was given was Abraham took upon him the sign of circumcision because God said that was the sign of the covenant that God had made with him. And then we see this man of faith and others who are listed in Hebrews 11 who are included in that same statement, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Ultimately, God fulfills his promises in his time. And the key to all of it, of course, is faith. Hebrews chapter 11. So tonight we move from that beginning of Stephen's speech into the second portion of Stephen's speech, which reminds us of basic principles upon which God works as he deals with his people. Stephen is giving it to them and they are listening to it as history, no doubt listening very carefully to see whether or not Stephen understands their history. For these are the Jewish leaders, but Stephen is not merely giving these particular events in their history so that he can show that he has studied his books. He is giving these because he is pointing out the way in which God deals with those who walk by faith and the way in which God deals with those who reject his truth. They're going to agree with Stephen in terms of all the history here and then at the end Stephen is going to pull the theology together and use what they have heard and agreed with so that they will, in fact, either have to condemn themselves or stop Stephen's mouth. Verses 9 and following. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. You know, we have a very clear situation of that very problem in our text. In the preceding chapter, we saw what happened when Stephen debated with the various groups who were standing against this new band of Christians. They could not answer the wisdom by which he spoke unto them. They were losing followers. People were becoming Christians. There was envy. We're going to see in a moment what envy is connected to in Scripture. And delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan <clears throat> and great affliction. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem, and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sychem. The first verse contains a massive amount of material whereby as they think back on their own history, these judges of the Sanhedrin, they perhaps have gotten their first uncomfortable feeling. Because just as the fathers did, Stephen is going to conclude his sermon with the fact that they have done the same thing to our Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who are with us in our study of Genesis know that Joseph is a type or a picture of Christ. 
truly a real human being who lived on earth, but the scripture gives him to us and uses him as an illustration of the way in which our Lord would be. So as he speaks of Joseph in this passage here, think of all those points at which we saw Joseph was very similar to our Lord Jesus Christ. He was hated of his brethren. We find him becoming a bond servant, as Paul speaks of him, a doulos in the New Testament as he comes to earth. We find him giving his life for his brethren. We find that Joseph is a man against whom no evil sin is listed in the scripture. He's tempted and yet he resists Christ, tempted in all points like as we yet without sin. Many things, we'll not go over those all again now. I want you only to notice the fact that we see a very parallel situation to what we find here in our text as Stephen is preaching his sermon. He doesn't point the finger yet. He's building his case against those who are his accusers. The patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph. You know, it's rather interesting. Those who have the promises of God are still sinners. It was the patriarchs who were moved with envy to sell him. It wasn't the Hittites who came in and captured him and sold him. It wasn't the Amorites who came and uh, wiped out all the rest of the family and dragged him off as a slave to Egypt. It was the patriarchs, those who founded the 12 tribes of Israel. Those who have the promises of God are still sinners. We need to remember that. We need to understand that we also will be faced with temptation into which we can easily fall and it often starts with a temptation related to our attitudes. Something inside of us that then moves us to action which is a sinful action. The patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph. You know, we don't become sinlessly perfect in this life. I know there are those who teach sinless perfection. They teach what they call sanctification, but they don't mean the same thing by that that you and I mean or that the scripture means. They believe that you can reach a point whereby you are no longer sinning, where you are in a state of sinlessness. Even the Apostle Paul made it clear that he still had a struggle even when he wrote the book of Romans, the magnificent doctrinal epistle to the Romans. Listen to what he says in chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Rather interesting. That picture of being sold into bondage, what we see with Joseph. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Paul was fighting a battle. Paul was having a struggle. There were some things he wanted to do and he discovered that his flesh was slothful and sluggish and wouldn't do it. There were other things that he hated to do and he found himself doing those things. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good for the law points out sin. The law is the righteous standard of God. You are not saved by the law. You are not sanctified by the law. You are condemned by the law. The law is good. It upholds God's moral righteous standard. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul had not become sinlessly perfect when he wrote the book of Romans one of the greatest doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Just remember that. The flesh never desires to do good. In your flesh dwells no good thing. So if anything good comes, it has to be from some place other than the flesh. For to will is present with me, Paul had been awakened by the Spirit of God and given new life through faith in Christ, so he knew the difference between right and wrong. He desired to do that which was right, but how to perform that which is good, 
I found not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. You know, he doesn't just give us one verse on this. He gives us this extended passage all the way down through verse 25. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The Apostle John also makes it very clear, and he gives to us a pithy theological statement both concerning the old sin nature and also concerning active sin in our lives. You know it, I think at least you know verse 9, the verse that is wedged between those two verses in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's talking about the sin nature. Those of you who perhaps a year or so ago were listening to the radio broadcast know that we were talking about this passage here. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You don't fool anybody else. You deceive yourself. If you say, I'm not a sinner, the only one that you're tricking is yourself. And it also says something else very important. It says the truth is not in us. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then we know in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10 deals not with the sin nature, but with active sin that we do. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We say, oh, I haven't sinned. I haven't sinned. I haven't done evil. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, we're told in Ecclesiastes. You and I are all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we say we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar because God says you are a sinner. When we say we have not sinned, it's an indication <clears throat> that we are biblical ignoramuses. His word is not in us. No, as we look at this, even those who have the promises of God are still sinners. The second thing that we note out of that verse is that there is no such thing as a little sin. All so-called little sin always grows into big sin unless it's immediately confessed, unless it's immediately repented of, unless we immediately go to God's throne of grace for cleansing. Look at Romans 7.13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Folks, you can't keep sin still in your life. You can't keep it as your little tiny pet sin that just sort of hides out in one corner of your heart. Because sin grows. Sin is a grotesque fungus that eats your heart out. Our Lord Jesus Christ, using leaven, which is a kind of mold that causes bread to rise and permeates the whole bread, speaks of it in several different ways. He uses leaven to explain some things. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And then a few verses later, because they didn't understand, he explains it, and then it says they understood how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The first area in which we see a, a collapse here is in the area of doctrine. 
a little bit of false doctrine will begin to spread. And as it begins to spread, it permeates everything around it, just like leaven does with bread. You put a pinch of yeast or leaven into the dough, you cover it and leave it in a warm place, and what does the dough do? It begins to expand and swell, and the gases push the little parts apart until the leaven gets into other parts, and it pushes more apart until the bread rises, and you see the, the cloth that's covering that pan begin actually to rise until it has permeated the whole thing. False doctrine does that, but that's not the only thing that Christ speaks of. We find in Mark chapter 8, verse 15, he says this again, but he also adds someone else. He charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. The leaven of Herod. What do we know about Herod as we look through the New Testament? We find that he is a man filled with carnality. He's a man filled with the lust of the flesh. We read the histories of, Her of the Herod family even. And it is filled with murder and intrigue and immorality. And it's filled with all kinds of cheating and lying and stealing and drunkenness and debauchery and immorality of the grossest of kinds. The leaven of Herod. When the church permits carnality in the church and does not incise it as the Apostle Paul tells us it must be done in 1 Corinthians 6, it will very soon spread to the rest of the church. We find that Jesus uses leaven to speak of one other thing too in Luke chapter 12 verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable people, multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Oh yes, there are many different ways in which leaven is used in the New Testament to speak of the way in which sin permeates our lives. It never remains the same. How so-called little sins begin to grow until they turn into very, very, very large sins. Hypocrisy. We pretend to be one thing when we are really something else. The Apostle Paul picks that up in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, and he writes, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Paul is dealing in 1 Corinthians with sin in the church. There are many different sins that are listed in 1 Corinthians, whereby that church, although they had all the spiritual gifts, and they thought themselves very spiritual, were riddled with wickedness. And Paul says, Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. He takes them back to the feast of Passover. He takes them back to the feast of unleavened bread. He reminds them of what Christ did on the cross when he died in our place. Let us therefore keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Here we find leaven used for more types of sin. Malice, hatred, wickedness. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Not hypocrisy, not lies, but sincerity and truth. The Apostle Paul explains to us in Galatians how this leaven permeates the entire lump and listen to the things that he says about it because it takes us back unto the law. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You've heard me preach in the past how the law is a unit. The law is not a bunch of piecemeal things that you can pick and choose from. The law is a unit. It's like a chain. Back in colonial times, there was a, a gigantic chain that stretched across the river at West Point. 
And when a ship came in that was an enemy ship, the chain was raised so that it could not come up the river. And when a friendly ship came in, the chain was lowered to the bottom of the river so that the ship could pass through. Now suppose that the center link in that chain rusted through and broke. Have you broken merely one link or have you broken the chain? You've broken the chain. It's the same way with the law. If you want to place yourself back under the law and you violate one command, you have broken the law. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear here. Christ has become of no effect unto you that are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now listen to the last three verses, very, very short, each one of them. But each one of them driving home the point, ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. There is no such thing as little sin. And Stephen is pointing that out to them as he speaks first of the envy that the patriarchs were moved with and then how they committed man-stealing and sold into captivity their own brother to be a slave. Little sins always end up with big sins. The third thing that we notice here is what we think of as a single sin is always connected to other sins. Galatians chapter 5 also speaks of this. And it gives to us a long list of sins that are contrary to Christian liberty. Oftentimes we think, if I could only do that, I'd really be free. I'm doing my own thing. But sins are linked together. Listen to Galatians 5, beginning in verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The way in which we grow in grace is not by keeping the law. The way in which we have peace in the body is not by each of us carefully examining one another so that we see whether or not we have broken the law. It is walking in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know, the leaven of Herod was carnality was the lusts of the flesh. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. Now listen to this last phrase. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Doesn't that echo what Paul said in Romans chapter 7? As long as you are trying to do it yourself, as long as you are trying to keep the law yourself, you will fail. It's only as we walk in the Spirit, and those of you who have heard me preach over these last four years know that that means to be walking by faith. Stephen has just dealt with that. That was his foundation stones, you remember? All of them were tied together with the issue of faith. He goes on, but if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Keeping the law will not give you victory over the flesh. What we think of as a single sin is always connected to other sins. Now listen to where envy, which is the sin we see here, which grew into selling their brother into slavery. Listen to where it goes. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Fornication uncleanness, 
lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. From heresy, you remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Beware of their doctrine. Here we have heresies, then we have envyings, then we have murders. We've had envyings and heresies, which the scribes and the Pharisees have had back here in chapter 6. And it's going to lead to what is the next thing in the list? To murders. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, these are things that demonstrate your relationship or your non-relationship to Christ. Several weeks ago, I also brought in, and I think I'll bring in once again here at this point, what Paul says about the usage of the law. We know that the law is good if a man leaves it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. This is not for the righteous man. You can't get saved this way. You can't get sanctified this way. If you are righteous, it's not the law that is your standard. It's walking by faith. It's walking in the Spirit who will empower you then to do what is right in the sight of God, not the flesh pulling itself up by the bootstraps. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that's the sodomites, for men-stealers, Exactly what we see here, Stephen reminds them that their patriarchs did. For liars, for perjured persons, they certainly lied, didn't they, when they came home to Father Jacob. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, we saw heresies was listed before the envyings and the murders and the drunkenness. We find that our Lord Jesus Christ speaks of that in the passages we just read in the Gospels. Things that are against sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. I know I've spent a long time here on this one verse, but you see, if you pick up on what Stephen is saying, what he is doing here is he is laying a very solid foundation which will condemn those who are his accusers. The fourth thing that we see here in this passage is that God is sovereign even in the bad things of life. Look at that marvelous phrase. All these bad things happened, but God was with him. How far can you go if God is with you? What do you have to fear if God is with you? What is there to complain about if God is with you? You! God is with us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does his name Emmanuel mean? We've just come through the Christmas season. His name shall be called Emmanuel. And Matthew explains it to us if you don't know Hebrew. In Matthew 1.23, which being interpreted is God with us. Joseph, but God was with him. What is your name? Put it into that slot. Christian, God was with him. There is nothing we have to fear. There is nothing from which we have to shrink. There is no reason for us ever to have to compromise. For God is with us. God is sovereign even in the bad things of life. We are his children and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
Now remember Joseph as you read this next portion of Romans chapter 8. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is no reason to fear. There is no reason to shrink back. There is no reason to compromise. There is no reason to cry and weep and moan and groan and complain with God with us. And the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings are so minuscule that to set them side by side with the glory is a joke. Not worthy to be compared. Verses 28 and following, I know you know some of these verses. And we know that all things, not some things, not most things, not 99% of the things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? Stephen believed it. Stephen was willing to stand and speak boldly. And Stephen was willing to set the stage in such a way that they knew the history. They knew what had happened. And they were the ones who descended from the bad guys and were doing the same thing. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, what a marvel election, predestination, the sovereignty of God is. Because it's not merely, okay, God chose some people and they get to get saved. Do you understand what he predestinated us for? That means has a destination chosen in advance and a destination is something you reach. He predestined us, it says here, to be conformed to the image of his son. God is working in you to transform your life. We spoke about holiness this morning. We talked about how God has called us to live holy lives, how he is working in us to produce that. And every man that hath this hope in him, that is the hope of the imminent return of Christ, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. There's an intensity to that purity, holy, white heat. The blazing Shekinah glory of God where sin cannot approach. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? There is no reason to fear. There is no reason to compromise. There is no reason to moan and groan and complain. If God be for us, and God is with us, Joseph knew God was with him. How it changed his life. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Imagine a very, very wealthy father. And the very, very wealthy father has a child. And he gives that child a hundred billion dollars. And he gives that child an estate the size of the state of Texas. Now, do you think he will withhold from the child a glass of milk? God has given us already his son the very best possible gift. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Oh, how comforting the sovereignty of God is. But God was with him. The next verse we see that faithful men receive the blessing of God except in very exceptional circumstances. For example, Job. God sometimes chooses, and he does do this. He sometimes chooses men who are close to him, who walk with him on a daily basis who love him, who serve him, whose entire focus in life is on him. He chooses them 
to go through certain times of suffering that he might prove to Satan and to the world around that this is a man who will love him and trust him regardless of outward circumstances. Job put it best, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Folks, that's faith. And Job was a man who hurt. We see it in every one of his speeches. Sometimes God chooses men to go through those things. But the general rule, though not the exclusive rule, is that faithful men receive the blessing of God except in those exceptional circumstances. We find there are four general areas of blessing that are listed for us here in verse 10. God delivered him out of all his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. The first thing that is brought to the memory of these men who have put Stephen on trial is that God delivered him from his affliction. We need to understand that God delivers from affliction in various ways. As we look at the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, we find the heroes of faith in the first half of that chapter all had glorious victories. We find the heroes of faith in the last half of that chapter are listed under the phrase, but others. And some of them were stoned, and some of them were torn apart, and some of them were thrown to wild animals, and they lived in dens and caves of the rocks. The world was not worthy even of them. God delivers through different methods. Listen to what David says in the Psalms. Psalm 34, 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. It's a promise in the word of God. But it also makes it clear that the righteous will suffer afflictions. Paul tells us that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you never had any kind of persecution? Never had anyone speak against your Christian faith? Perhaps it's because you have not made Christ known. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, those who had been faithful in their witness and who had gone through some suffering as a result. And Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Listen to what he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. See, Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was a man who stood for the truth. Joseph was a man who made known the revelation that God gave to him, and his brothers became envious and ultimately wanted to kill him, but sold him instead because, you see, envy was also connected to covetousness. There are no little sins. They are all joined together. They all grow if you allow them to. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You can't face it any other way. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. When you proclaim the gospel of Christ, you will run into opposition. That's what happened to Stephen here. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith. Now listen to the next phrase. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. 
Don't think it a strange thing when you go through the fiery trials. But know that God delivers from affliction. The third thing that we find here is favorable attention by those in authority over him. God brought him to the attention of Pharaoh, and it was God who brought him out of prison. It was God who brought him to the attention of Pharaoh. It was God who used these miserable butler and baker to bring him to the attention of Pharaoh, people who forgot him. Favorable attention. Proverbs 22, 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. What is the business that God has given you to do? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. God has given us some business to do. The next thing God gave him was wisdom, verse 10. Wisdom. You've heard me preach on it. I'll not belabor it tonight just to give you a few verses the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction the fear of the Lord Joseph started with that that's what we have to start with for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding Proverbs 2 7 he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly if you are continuing to walk in the flesh, you will not have wisdom. It will merely get darker and darker and darker for you. Until you scream out in agony. Wisdom is the principal thing, Proverbs 4, 7. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the holy is understanding. Wisdom always goes back to God. Joseph always went back to God. And as a result, he stood in wisdom before Pharaoh. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh saw the wisdom of God in Joseph. Pharaoh promoted him second in command in Egypt. And that's what we find last, his promotion. He made him governor over the house of Egypt and all his house. Proverbs 10.4 tells us, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one. He setteth up another. Deliverance from affliction. Favorable attention by those in authority. Wisdom. Promotion. It all comes from the hand of God. Our time is up. We'll close here tonight. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the life of Joseph. And we thank you for the way in which you directed Stephen to bring out those precise elements in the life of Joseph. Which would demonstrate what it takes to be a man of faith. He's spoken of Abraham. Now he speaks of Joseph. He reminds us of the covenant promises of God. He reminds us of the way in which God fulfills them. He reminds us of what it takes to walk by faith. He reminds us of those who are diligent and not slothful and who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Father, we pray that your word would convict us of sin where there is sin in our lives. Oh, Father, sin does not bring joy and rejoicing. It brings a deadly slumber. It brings damage. It brings death. As we stand before you, Father, we are not sinless. Oh, positionally, we're seen in Christ. But we still have that struggle with the flesh of which Paul speaks. A struggle that cannot be overcome by mere law-keeping. A struggle that must be overcome by grace through faith, walking in the Spirit, walking by faith.
and not walking in the flesh. Father, we pray that day by day you will enable us, when sin rears its ugly head, to confess it as sin, to repent of it, to turn from it, to walk in the light as our Lord Jesus Christ is in the light, to have fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with one another, that we might bear testimony to a watching world that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life as well as the one who is our Savior, the one who is Emmanuel, the one who is God with us. Father, we thank you once again for this portion of your word. We pray that you will bless our hearts with it, fill our hearts with joy and gladness. Help us to go forth from this place walking by faith and day by day being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ as we grow closer to him and as we look for his imminent return. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.